The light was magical. It was just you and me and one fag, a waiter, and he was swimming nude. It was this ritual. My own shirt was off. It was an abandoned part of the beach in a pretty gay town. All the other women were way on the other side of the beach. I liked this loner setup, and I felt I was more than a bit of a man. A friend of mine used to have a crush on this waiter in New York. He had kind of an overdeveloped upper lip like a duck. And he was slim, and he combed his hair back in a classic old-fashioned style. Not extravagant at all, but he was hip in a continental way. The fact that, that he could be with me on this beach in another city almost 15 years later and not recognize me at all made me comfortable. It was like family. I had my dog, and I had him who didn't know me. I have a, I have a striped towel, orange and dark blue, one of two. I buy it, I forget it, I buy another one. You think it was a straight town now. The beach is littered with couples and people with kids. Some man flies his kite delightedly, and I want to say, hey, can you please go back the other way? You're taking way too much space. Yeah, I think it's wrong to talk to people like that. I can leave, go to the gym, I think staring at the dunes. I can walk the street looking for people to have dinner with. And then I put my nose in my notebook, and I'm writing again. Save. The problem with getting Rosie to the beach on the little military island is that you have to walk here from way back down there because the beach is right here by the guy with the gun. So the dog would have to be able to walk that far, and this dog can't. This dog has become a puppet in her own life. I lift her up and I talk to the dog head she is now, the permanently alive dog breathing in here. In fact, I'm writing this book to keep talking to her. Paige came to visit. I told her it's not going to be a vacation. She said very seriously, I know. And she would get out with the dog at the mouth of the beach, and I would go park and then join them. At some point, sitting on the beach in the morning, it seemed like maybe about 100 guys in crew cuts went by running. She took a picture. She smiled at me and shrugged. It was the army training on the beach. I thought of her being Canadian. This is a whole other kind of beach. After you died, I went over there, and I heard on the radio that the president, George Bush, was there. And I stuck my head out the window, and I started screaming at people. <laughs> He's a killer, don't you know? Then I realized I couldn't go there anymore. You know, they took Emma Goldman's boyfriend out in the desert there, and they anally raped him. The San Diego paper said they should do it to her, too. It's still that paper. That's why I was so mad. He's my president, too. She changed suddenly that week. We went up to L.A. for the weekend because there was nobody left in San Diego she could stay with. It was getting harder and harder to find anyone to stay with a dying dog. I called this one, and she'd refer to me to that one. Since about June, which is when the fits began, I'd wake up every morning thinking about it and unable to plan the future because of not knowing where to be and, frankly, also feeling a little chased out of the town by all the different kinds of young women. I felt overwhelmed by them. A college town is like totally bugged. You can't be old. You can't be invisible. You're just walking around being lonely. That's why everyone's married. You're either wrapped or unwrapped. There's too much youth. That's the job. It's too erotic. I came here with somebody, and it didn't last. I had you. So we took you up to L.A. for the weekend with us, and there was a dog lady you could stay with. She reminded me of the couple with a kid on East 7th Street that you stayed it with when you were a puppy. This lady just had dogs, maybe cats too. No husband, just animals. Cushions all around. You looked a little stunned when we left. It was just for the night, and then we took you home. How was she? She wouldn't eat dog food. She just had steak. The woman shrugged like it was cute. She must have liked that, we laughed. To be an animal owner, you get to be broad, even a little deceitful. Nobody can speak up for herself. It's like an eternally silent child, who you trust, who shouldn't trust you, who keeps playing with the same ball and likes the same walk and is getting old. We stopped off at that great place in San Juan Capistrano and got food, and you had your own little taco. That was fun. We all ate in the car and drove home. I don't remember being happy. It was dark. I remember being full. We were all in the car. It was nice. Everyone had food, and we drove down the coast. These places are all Catholic places. San Diego, San Luis Obispo. 
I think of the monks who started the missions and the story they told us in Catholic school about the monks having boiling water poured on their heads. The Native Americans were making a joke. It was that one detail they taught us forever. The first night Paige was gone, I was standing out in the front yard in my BVDs, holding up your ass in a puddle of piss. It was like dawn. It was all night long. It kept happening. And my arm hurt and your legs were gone. And I thought, we can't do this anymore. You would not eat dog food, never again. You would only eat sausages and little steaks. And meanwhile, you, would no, you no longer would shit. You would never shit again for the rest of your life. She'll shit on the other side. That was my joke. Meanwhile, I can no longer eat those sausages you get in health food stores that you liked because they remind me of your turds. Your whole inside aching, waiting for relief. I went out on Friday night to read in that sex shop in North Park with the big back room where things happened. You were so quiet when I left. You were barely breathing. You were almost gone. There was this ottoman at the window and you were where you were lying. You were so still. Before Paige left, she lowered the bed to make it easier for you to get up because she couldn't jump. But it was like changing the world and she won't be in it long. I remember thinking that. I liked it low for a while. I used to clean this woman's house in New York years before. Her cat died and the cat was in bardo on the bed when I cleaned. I worked with this guy, David, who got me the job, who died of AIDS, and he said, go look in the bedroom. It somehow made the house feel very good when we cleaned, having a dead body in there. I like to make it heavier sometimes, saying versions of the same thing. I mean, I mean here. You probably already guessed it, but I like saying it again. That one little piece again with a twist and a thud. I don't feel this way about everything, but there are moments that need to be heavy as a fact, not an idea. When I got the puppy when I was a kid, my father said, go in the bedroom, Eileen. It was my mother and father's bedroom where I was never allowed, so I hated him telling me to do it. It didn't make sense. It scared me. Go in the bedroom, Eileen. The little dog walked out. I read for Rosie that night, read every poem she was in. I dedicated it to her, not that she needed it. She did not need poetry. She was it. Mainstay in my liturgy for 16.5, almost 17 years, she was observed. I was companioned, seen. I read a long one about dogs I wrote before I had ever even had one. It was about attachment, how I wanted it, needed it. At least I had habits, said the poem, since I didn't have a dog. There was one about walking on the beach with a dog and hearing things, hearing old people groaning as they walked in the sand. One was about counting things when I walked her, almost losing her once, the color of her leash, my friend dying and its color getting mixed up with that. Her leash was so important. I started assigning numbers to each of the colors of the world, like it was a paint by numbers that year before she was dying. I filmed her, too. I was scared. The painting was fading. I was having my religion torn from me. Her body smelled corny. Her fur smelled like corn to me always, and I never bathed Rosie until she was sick. I bathed her if she rolled in shit or dead fish. That was her P-Town trick, and I never washed a floor. Not in my life, in all my worlds, I never looked down. She had sores on her body all her life. All the puppies in her litter had bumps on their bodies. I got worried, but after a while, I'd just leave them there. I had a girlfriend who thought that was cruel. I went to the vet when I had money. You died when I had money. Most of the other puppies in your litter died. There was Africa, who was last seen running between parked cars, scared. He was with that cute young couple, but they must have abandoned him. There was 38, who someone in the neighborhood found and dropped off at the pound. What's going to happen to him now? The guy asked as he was leaving. Gas, said the woman at the counter. No one wants a pit. What cage is he in? asked the guy. 38. He went back and got him. We used to see 38 all the time. There was Buster, who lived in Tompkins Square Park with a homeless kid. We saw him sometimes, then I heard he ate rat poison and died. Point is that I am a fucking saint. There was your mother, Lucy, white with a handful of pale black spots, who lived with the restaurant woman on 4th Street, then Lucy was gone. We used to see her up on the fire escape all the time. I needed to talk to you about things. This is in the fall. You died in December. 
I heard about this woman who could communicate with animals. I was having dinner with two friends, one from the West Coast and one from the East, and they both had heard of such a woman, and it turned out she was the same one. That's good. Rosie's in California, I'm in New York, the woman's in Western Mass. The way we do it, Don Allen said, is you tell me what you want me to ask her. It's going to be silent on the line for a few minutes, because I'll be talking to her. I'll tell you what Rosie has to say for herself. Don came back giggling. This is an amazing dog. I've never heard a dog talk this way before. She's quite a little poet. Oh, she must have known, everyone says. I don't know. My question was, what was keeping Rosie around? She likes the smell of the world. She likes the feeling of the wind on her fur. She likes grass. She loves San Diego. She's very happy here. She says she'll cross that bridge when she comes to it, in reference to moving to Los Angeles. That's my family's talk. I knew it meant she wouldn't be here. That's how we say no. When I came in from the reading, she was on her hassock by the window. Again, very still. I had to stare to catch her breathing. I crouched down. We've been together for a while, I said. If you're ready to go, it's okay. I got down with her eye to eye. It was gray. I felt like she was swimming in some fluid, and I was in there with her. It was our intimacy a silent place. I felt I was guided by her, her deep, prescient calm. I would miss her so much. I wanted to keep swimming with her, but I couldn't help it. I pulled out. I had to say no. I'm not dying with you, but who will I be without my dog? And I carried you to the bed. Thank you. Uh, before I'm going to read from my book, I want to get a the guitar back here and play a song for her because it's what I really know how to do. You hear that guitar? Good enough. When a man has a dog in the city, a man needs to walk in the park, take a little stroll by the riverside, smoke a cigarette there in the dark, living in the city. Living with a dog. And a man has to carry him a plastic bag on his person at all times. When a dog dumps on the sidewalk, walking away is a crime living in the city. Walking with a dog. A man likes living in the city, city, city. But a man has to find some work. Walking with a dog is a kind of a job Make you feel like a fool and a jerk Living in the city Working like a dog Work out, Lotto A dog likes living in the city City City. In the city, there's a lot of other mutts. Checking in front, checking in back. No ifs, no ands, just buts. Oh, living in the city. Dog checking out a dog. It's a pretty good way to meet a woman. If a woman is walking their dog, you just say, What's her name? How old is she? It's easy, like rolling off a log, checking out a woman. Man acting like a dog. But when a man has a fight with a woman, a man needs to go for a walk. Walking with a dog is easy. He listens, he don't talk. Talking to a dog. Talk to me. Walking with a dog in the winter, in the wind, and the rain, and the snow is a drag. It's hard as hell to keep the cigarette lit and get the shit in the plastic bag. <laughs> Living in the city. Walking with a dog. When a man has a dog in the city, 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 city. 
Man, he's a walk in the park. Take a little stroll by the riverside. Smoke a cigarette there in the dark. Living in the city. Living with a dog. My, my book is, a, is a 50 pretty short essays. And it also includes a lot of my song lyrics, which is my main writing mode. But I also include some of my father's writing. My father was a famous journalist. His name was Loudon Wainwright, as it turns out. He had a column in Life magazine called The View From Here. So, and he has a beautiful, I was telling you about his column about having to put our dog down. It's a beautiful column and it's, it's too long to do here tonight. But anyway, I'm gonna read uh, something about uh, me. And uh, I gotta find out which chapter it's in. You think I'd, here we go, 61. Okay, I'm there. One of my second grade classmates at Warner Avenue Grammar School in Westwood, California was Liza Minnelli. And we were in love, or at least I thought so. Like everybody else, I knew that her mom was Dorothy from The Wizard of Oz. Having the daughter of Judy Garland as my friend in 1954 was a pretty big deal, though not quite as big a deal as living on Hutton Drive, because that was the same street in Benedict Canyon that Davy Crockett, Fess Parker, and his sidekick, Georgie Russell, Buddy Epson, lived on. Gene Barry, Bat Masterson on TV, had a house on Hutton Drive, too. And his son, Mike, was in the second grade with me and Liza. I thought Liza was so beautiful. Like me, she had freckles, but she also had her father, Vincent Minnelli's big, dark, haunted eyes. One day after school, I was invited over to Liza's house in Beverly Hills, and her mother was home. I remember Judy Garland as being a nice person, but someone who didn't look like Dorothy at all. <laughs> she had short hair and was much older and quite a bit fatter than the girl in The Wizard of Oz. Liza's baby brother, Joey, was there that afternoon, as was her five-year-old sister, Lorna Love. Their father, Liza's stepdad, Sif, Sid Luft, was conspicuous, conspicuously absent. Liza's mom seemed to really like me. At least that's what I remember. She was very taken with my freckled pug nose and said that it was cute. I also distinctly recall big green peas on the plates that were put in front of us for, for our early supper. There must have been other things, but all I remember are those peas. Perhaps I unconsciously connected the greenness of the peas with the Emerald City. <laughs> After dinner, Liza and I went outside to play. In a shed at the end of the house's long driveway were Liza's Thunderbird Junior convertible convertibles, battery-powered kitty cars made of molded fiberglass. T-Bird replicas almost down to the last detail with actual rubber tires. The cars were about six feet long and two feet high. One foot pedal served as an accelerator and the other as the brake. The Thunderbird Junior, manufactured by the Power Car Company in Mystic, Connecticut, could travel up to three hours, three miles per hour. This was a toy only the parents of rich kids could afford. Lee Iacocca's daughter had one. Liza had two. The game we played was Chauffeur Starlet. <laughs> I was the former, she of course the latter. I drove up and down the black top driveway while she lounged on the back of the T-Bird Jr. convertible and waved to an imaginary throng of adoring fans. <laughs> Apparently, she had witnessed something similar in her real life. 
Our family moved back east in 1956, and not long after we arrived, I wrote a letter to Liza. It was newsy and a little lame, what you would expect from a 10-year-old. I talked about living in Westchester and how different that was from LA, how there was cold winter weather and even snow. I asked her what she thought of Elvis in particular and rock and roll in general. With a sense of excitement and expectation, I mailed the letter at the Bedford Village Post Office. Weeks went by, and then months, but still no word back from Liza. I was inconsolable. My mother tried her best to soften the blow, telling me that perhaps the letter hadn't been delivered or that somehow it had gotten lost in the mail. I didn't buy it, though, and considered Liza's not writing back a cruel rejection. Eighteen years later, in 1974, after, right after she won the Oscar for her performance in Cabaret, I wrote, I wrote a song for Liza. After school, we two engaged in prepubescent play. At your house, afternoons were spent cruising your black driveway. In your junior Thunderbird electric kitty car, I chauffeured you. You lounged in back, back then you were a star. Your mother, she was famous. And so you were famous too. Call me groupie, call me gigolo, I fell in love with you. I asked you once, what will you be? And you quickly said, a nurse. <laughs> but the way you sparkled way back then, I knew you'd caught the curse. Everybody has got a block off which they are a chip. But some chips grow to be great blocks, so Liza, let it rip. This is your ex-chauffeur who speaks. Indeed, you've caught the curse. Now you've got that Oscar. I don't think you'll be a nurse. <laughs> Of course, I hoped Liza would hear my song somehow, and I fantasized that she might want to get in touch with me. But again, there was no response. Then about a year after I wrote the song, I did an interview with a guy from Danish National Radio. A few weeks earlier, he had been granted 15 minutes with Liza while she was in Copenhagen for her big sold-out concert there. During their taped interview, which was held in Ms. Minnelli's luxurious hotel suite, he played her a recording of my song on his cassette machine and recorded her reaction to hearing it. The Oscar-winning actress's comment was something along the lines of, oh yes, I remember Loudy Wainwright. If he keeps singing that way, he's going to ruin his voice. <laughs> so that's the end of that one. Uh, thank you. So uh, I want to read something that I wrote. Um, most of this stuff was written in the last uh, three years, but I also found some stuff that I wrote. This is something that I wrote in the, back in the early 80s. Uh, so imagine me uh, 30 years younger or something. Or I'll try to imagine. I try to do that all the time, actually. <laughs> yeah, I've got kids. This is called scrambled eggs. Yeah, I got kids back home in the homes they share with their mothers. Homes without fathers, husbands, or boyfriends. It sounds sad, doesn't it? Well, it is if you want it to be. It's sad when I see them when they come and see me, when they come and visit me. Sounds like I'm in jail. Jail for once wed bachelor fathers. My kids are curious about me and I really believe they need me, but as all the studies have shown, kids are very strong and flexible. They can adapt to a bad situation, such as a broken home. For a while anyway, but then as all the studies have also shown, Kids from broken homes sometimes get screwed up later on. That's a terrible expression, a broken home. 
like a machine that doesn't work properly or a vase that's fallen off a mantle and then is badly glued back together. At this point, the kids are young, and my biggest fear is that they're going to hate and blame me for their unhappy lives. It will be my fault because I couldn't stick it out with their mothers, that I wasn't around when I needed them. Freudian slip, slip when they needed me. My own father stuck it out, but he wasn't really around even when he was in the same room. He was certainly a presence, at least, which is something I can't say for myself, except for these filial visits. Usually I pick them up at the airport, handed off at the gate by a smiling stewardess. They are unaccompanied minors and tagged as such. I suppose someday there might be an unaccompanied minor strike. Afterward, after an awkward hug, there's a strange long walk to wait at the baggage carousel, which, unlike a merry-go-round, is, is a fairly serious place. The drive into the city is pretty nice. We're going to my house, and there's an anticipation about that in the car or the taxi. Do they remember what it looks like? Dad's place. Has it changed since the last time? I'm excited about what it will feel like to have my children in my house. Will they transform the place from a lonely bachelor pad into a happy home? In the vehicle, we talk about what's taken place in our lives since we last saw one another. Nothing important. I finished a record. School's fine. Then we get there, and everybody's excitement wears off, and we settle into the job, down to the real problem of what the hell we are going to do together. Me, did you eat on the plane? Them, yeah, but we could eat again. Me, what would you like? Them, I don't know. Me, some eggs? Them, okay. Me, scrambled? Them, okay. Then they watch television while I try to make great scrambled eggs. Scrambled eggs that they will never forget. Scrambled eggs that they will remember when they're 80. My father used to make good scrambled eggs and every once in a while linguine with white clam sauce. Those were his specialties. By that I mean they were all he could cook. It's not easy to cook, and thanks, thank God for the television, for without the television, what would they do while I was cooking? Read, draw, maybe for a while, but this, this is not the 1930s, it's the early 80s, and it's New York City, and you don't suggest to your kids, why not go outside and play? Pretty soon, even the television lets me down, and they start to fight with each other. Now, this, what this is truly is an effort on their part to get something really happening, something really cooking, not just eggs, because they know that when they start to argue, bicker, fight, I get crazy because fighting is wrong and I have to fix it. But fighting is also their job, the job they've been sent to do by their mother. <laughs> their job is to come visit me in New York and make me fucking crazy. I try to control the fighting with the wimpy, imploring kids, doesn't work. Soon it shifts into, kids, cut that out. No dice. Next comes, okay, I'm warning you. Wow, a warning. <laughs> then it peaks with, God damn it, I told you, etc. If I'm angry enough, they stop fighting because miraculously we've made contact with each other. There's a connection between them and this total stranger their father. And it's just like the yelling they get at home from their real parent, their mother. Lower lips quiver, tears well up, sinuses clog, the crying starts. Now something interesting happens. I, I feel terrible too, but I can't let up. I've got to follow through with the punishment. Maybe a little more angry reprimanding. When they were younger, maybe a spanking. Turn off the TV, separating them, exiled behind closed doors. It's all damaging, but I don't hesitate to use any of it. Sooner or later, though, my anger and outrage subsides, and I change back into the kind, receptive, affectionate, sheepishly recalcitrant father. 
I explain why they shouldn't argue and fight and torture each other. Of course they understand. They understood before I yelled at them. But we need the ritual yelling and punishment, nodding of heads, wiping of more tears, the snorting and snuffling of warm, wet snot. They return to watching TV, peacefully, blissfully coexisting. I return to the scrambling of eggs, thinking I have accomplished something. Unfortunately, this batch of scrambled eggs will never be great. When a ship is sinking and they lower the lifeboats and hand out the life jackets the men keep on their coats the women and the children are the ones who must go first and the men who try to save their skins are cowards and are cursed every man's a captain men know how to drown Man the lifeboats if there's room, otherwise go down. It's the same when there's a war on, it's the men who go to fight. Women and children are civilians, when they're killed it's not right. Men kill men in uniform It's the way war goes When they run they're cowards When they stay they are heroes Every man's a general, men go off to war The battlefield's a man's world Cannon fodder's what they're for It's the men who have the power It's the men who have the might And the world's a place of horror Because each man thinks he's right A man's home is his castle So the family let him in But what's important in that kingdom Is the women and children A husband and a father Every man's a king but he's really just a drone Gathers no honey, has no sting Have pity on the general, the king and the captain They know they're dispensable after all their men And I, I was thinking about, you know, the nature of memoir and what you guys have written, and I think you both have done this really warts and all sort of writing um, about the people and animals and, and those things in your lives. Can you talk for a minute, each of you, and we'll start with Eileen, about the challenges of really giving, you know, talking about your poor dog who can't go to the bathroom, and that, how, is, is that challenging from an emotional and, an, and a technical standpoint? No, I think the part that's challenging is being there when your dog is dying. It's sort of like the writing part is sort of easy. It's sort of like the writing, I feel like the writing is like the, the, the coping mechanism. Um, as, soon as, as soon as Rosie started dying, I started writing because that's what I know how to do. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think, I think that's true. I, I, most artists or writers, I think, would say that. that or, like, say, about being a poet, it would be like the, the writing the poem part is easy. It's life that's the hard part. It's all the rest of the time. Well, Loudon, um, those who you write about are alive and can read. Um, so I imagine some of those challenges are different. Uh, well, in term, what do you mean in terms of the warts and all aspect of it all? Yeah. Their warts, too? Sure. 
everybody's warts, everybody's got them. And that, that's, I'm not just being glib. That's why when I, I'm, I've been called a confessional songwriter, and I do have a tendency to, I mean, I write a lot of different kinds of songs, but certainly I write a lot of songs about my family, the particular people in my family, my, my kids, my parents, my grandparents, my sister and brother. And uh, there have been some uncomfortable Thanksgiving dinners through the years. But um, it's not only uh, that I have a tendency uh, to expose me and them and the, and the very interesting dynamic, some of which is dysfunctional. Uh, it, it, but, and the reason that it works is because your families are all screwed up too. I've got news for you. <laughs> but uh, it, it's, you know, I, they're the most important people in my life. So those are my, those are the topics that I, you know, that's who, who I write about. And, and the stuff that happens with us, the good stuff and the not so good stuff is, 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 is worth, for me anyway, writing about. Uh, as one of the next Bob Dylans that you and several others went through, you then went through your career and you managed to be, have spouses and children who were very, very talented in their own right, did you ever feel a sense of competition with them, or did they feel pressure in competition with you and their mothers? This is to me, right? <laughs> <laughs> if the shoe fits. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm competitive. I was competitive with my own father. You know, we, we had the same name, we went to the same boarding school, and there was an Oedipal thing going on, in my mind anyway, that was happening with our mother. Uh, and and uh, so I do have, I have four kids, and three of them are, in, are musicians and songwriters, and they're extremely talented, and, and, and each in a kind of individual way. And um, yes, sometimes when, when it's about them, I say, hey, what about me, you know? Everybody has got a block off which they are a chip, as I sang in the Liza song. You know, uh, I'm proud of them, though, and uh, and uh, so I'm proud and and jealous. I will extend this to you while we're waiting on that. Have you felt in competition with any certain friends, confederates, family, anything like that through through your work? Well, I was just thinking that it's, what's interesting is that, like, you come from an artist's family, which I think is very different. You know, I think that the, if your family doesn't make art, then the, it's a little bit like, you know, that all those stories about cultures where people have never seen cameras before and they feel like their souls are being stolen. Uh -huh. I mean, I think in a certain way, nobody likes being represented because it's always your version of it, not theirs. But... Um, I mean, I, I've, you know, like I've lived in a community of artists, so you always ultimately, if you don't, you know, you write about somebody, ultimately somebody writes about you. You always, it's always going back and forth. But I think it's, it's interesting that, like, my family doesn't read my work, you know? And it's like... It's Even right, now, they don't? My nephews do. My nephews do. But my brother and sister, no. I mean, I think, I think it might be competition where it's sort of like, I got to do the thing, you know? And... They're, they're not poets themselves or writers. No, 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 no. So I think that it kind of weirds them out and they'd rather leave the story there, you know. Hmm. Um, but my nephews um, actually are, are kind of excited. Are you, can I ask you a question? Yes. I, do you wish that they would read your... Are you okay with that? Or would you, does it piss you off? Or would you like them to do it, read it one day? No, because I think it's kind of... I mean, it's kind of fine. I mean, it's weird, but it's, but it's kind of fine because it is the family I grew up in, so this would be the way we would be. Okay. You know, like even... An, and the thing I read, I was talking about being on the beach with a guy who didn't recognize me, and I knew who he was. And it was like, my family were like cats. You would just enter a room, and they'd be like, oh, it's you. you know? It was like an introvert family, you know? So it was like, nah, they're not going to, you know. Yeah, it's a different trip. Hi, it's a question for Eileen. And uh, I was skimming through Chelsea Girls earlier this week, and then I heard you all, and there was a passage about taking your shirt off in a bar. Mm -hmm. And then today, when you were reading, talking about being on the beach, I think you mentioned taking your shirt off. Is it, is and I just <laughs> wanted to know if you would elaborate on the meaning of taking your shirt off. <laughs> I think it's rank feminism. <laughs> because I don't think there's a woman alive who doesn't remember the moment where she was suddenly forced to wear a shirt. 
Like we were all kids, boys and girls, playing together. And at some point, whether it was five or nine or 11, it was like, uh-uh, this summer you have to wear a shirt. And I was like, why? You know? And so I think there's, I think there's some, you know, some, some of us have carried that into adulthood and then simply feel like, I mean, like Provincetown, it used to be that you could just be it on the beach with your shirt off. And then it's sort of like the, the mores of the town changed and the rangers got more harsh and, and would be, you know, you'd be like, they'd be like, put your shirt on. And it would be like kind of humiliating and you're like an adult and you're being told at the beach to put your shirt on. Um, so I, th I think, you know, I think it's, it's a, a, I think it's very uncultured of America to have such laws, you know, but, um, but I, you know, I'm, I'm of the, I'm of the shirtless variety <laughs> of human. I think this question is for Eileen. I met you, uh, I think, 14 years ago. I want to see ago. where these bodies are, because I, I'm... I know, there's a dark Hello. spot right there. Oh, there you, you are. Okay, this next body year. is right here. Okay. Um, I met you 14 years ago in a poetry class at Wesleyan with Elizabeth Willis. And um, you, I was looking for skies before I came today, and I noticed that the eye on the book was scratched. And I was like, why would I ever do that? You don't do Facebooks. And then I remembered that you did that. Uh-huh. And I, and I got really excited about bringing it with me today. But I also learned about skinny poems through Skies. And I was wondering, when I looked at your books today, they all appeared to be uh, long form or prose. And I was sort of curious about your writing process and how that might have evolved over the last 14 years or so. Oh, I mean, I guess I, I, feel, like, um, I feel like writing is sort of like a... Um if you, it's like a thrift shop. If you actually kept all the shirts you ever had, it would be really great. I mean, I think it's really sad that you, you, you know, especially if you live in a small apartment in New York like I do, that it's sort of like you have to keep shedding clothes in time or otherwise you just, you're like, you know, you're crowded out of your house by your books and your clothes. But, but I think in terms of writing, I feel like it's any, anything that I ever did, like writing skinny poems, I will always return to. You know, like writing a memoir is fun and writing novels, I mean, they're wide and they're fat. You know, but I kind of, and, and skinny poems, I guess I, I usually have a little notebook with me, and it's just about that, you know, that you can, if you carry a little skinny notebook, then you have two or three word lines, because that's how big it is, you know, but if you have a big legal pad, then you kind of write these wide lines. It's, it's like, it's like when everybody, I mean, I learned to write on a manual typewriter, so poems from that moment are all over the page, because you'd write a line, and you'd throw the carriage, and the typewriter would go over here. And so they will be all wild, but now we write on computers, so they're all like that. So a lot of it is just like, is like technology and, and culture and time. And I just wanted to say the thing about the eyes and the cover of the book is that, you know, it, you probably have the same thing with, with well, I think the golden era of, of recording was record albums, right? Like, I mean, we just, like, they were like the art that was in the room with us, you know, everybody knew what the cover of every album looked like, the music, the music that they loved. And with, you know, with books, the cover is the really political part. And, and you often, publishers won't let you do what you want. Because I had a really funky font that I wanted for that book, and they wouldn't let me use it, you know, because the publisher's wife designed the books. So then my revenge, of course, is you go on tour and you just mess up the font for years, <laughs> just to, to kind of take it back. Loudon, you mentioned that in the book mm -hmm. that you went out to San Francisco in the summer of 1967, mm -hmm. the summer of love, yeah. and you winded up in an apartment where Donald Fagan was also. Right. Is there any truth to the rumor that you were once ever you were asked to be in Steely Dan as the lead singer? Uh, you know, I read that. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I don't, maybe it's because we were, it was 1967 and we were in San Francisco, but I don't remember. Uh, but at that point, uh, Donald was not in Steely Dan. You know, they, I mean, he'd met Walter Becker at Bard, but he'd, that summer he'd gone out with us to this crash pad in, in, on McAllister Street. But I read in, uh, that Donald said in an interview that they'd asked me if I would be, be, I think he's one of the great, great, great singers. So it, it was a good choice not to have me be the singer of, the, of that band. Yeah. A few more quick questions. Um, I see a gentleman right there and one other last question. While we're thinking about it, I'll give you a second. Okay. Loudon, you write uh, some beautiful songs, uh, poignant, uh, very emotional. And, uh, but one song that you wrote, which I understand you don't like to sing anymore, 
is Dead Skunk. <laughs> and it's one of my favorites. And our kids have listened to this over the last 30, 40 years. Yeah. And our nieces and our grandchildren now. And they love the song. So I just want to share that. Well, I, I, I do sing it on special occasions. There's a chapter in the book about it, actually. You know, uh, if, it's, if it's a very rich person's birthday party and, <laughs> and they want to pay me to do it, or if I'm at a... Uh, it's not that I... I, I had to sing it. I, I, I loved having the success of it, you know, of having a song on the radio. It's, it's the most exciting thing to hear, hear you coming out of the car radio. But it got to be such a drag, and I was the funny animal guy, and I just didn't want to be that. So I, I put an embargo on it after, you know, right about 1975. I still do it, you know, if the money's right. <laughs> so make an offer. Uh, Loudon, I just wanted to um, ask you about your relationship with your sister, because you have written um, s several songs, but one that I'm thinking of, I think it's the birthday song for your sister that's very touching, and it's rare to hear a brother-sister kind of relationship described in folk music, so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the relationship between brother and sister. Are you talking about my song called The Picture? It could be that, yeah, I, c I couldn't, I was trying to think of the name of the song, yeah. yeah. Uh, that, that, that would be my sister Teddy. There's a, there's a song, uh, it's hard to talk about it. It would be, we don't have enough time, otherwise I'd play it for you. Anyway, she's a huge person in my life. And, uh, she, and uh, she, uh, you know, we were very close, 13 months apart. And uh, there, was, there was a picture that somebody had taken a snapshot of the two of us playing cards at a car, or, or drawing at a card table. And uh, the song is, all the song is, is a description of, of the, the picture. But I'm glad you like it. Well, we could do this all night. But uh, unfortunately, we have to wrap it up. Before you guys join us upstairs for the book signing, one more round of applause for Eileen Miles and Loudon Wainwright III. Thank you.